I want to welcome all of you again to this presentation from the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm joined by two colleagues. Um, the host for today is going to be Rick Del Vecchio, the Director of Advising for the College. Uh, and I'll be joined by my colleague, Wes Renfro, the Associate oh. Dean for Arts and Sciences. Uh, and what we want to do, we have an agenda. Um, we're going to scroll forward to the agenda in a second here. Um, and in the agenda, what we want to do is talk about how we're coping with this sort of situation, which we've never seen, a pandemic uh, situation. It's gonna give us a chance to sort of figure out uh, along with you, the kinds of things that we've put in place to deal with uh, these unusual circumstances. Um, what we'd like to do is also consider how we're preparing our students for success, not only during the time they're here, but post-graduation, we have to keep our eye on that because it is, after all, one of the things that we have cons consistently made a point of, of showing off of, in, in terms of the college's success. Uh, we want to talk a bit about what our graduates are expected to bring to the table. Uh, and then we want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what's next. We will get out of this at some point. We're going to be able to move beyond this pandemic point and start to think and talk about some res res resumption of normalcy, some kind of normalcy. I can't make any promises about what that new normal will look like, but there will be one. Uh, and once we get there, what will be the aftermath? What's gonna be left behind? What will we have done that will make a difference? I think is something that we wanna address just for a few minutes here. Uh, and then if we have time at the end of it, I think we will. One of the things we wanna make sure that we do is we give you a chance to ask us some questions if you'd like. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer them as best we can. So I'll pass the agenda over to my colleague, Wes Renfro, uh, and he will bring you up to date on what we've done to cope with this pandemic and to secure the success of our students uh, in this COVID period. So Dr. Renfro. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. So I'm gonna divide my remarks into sort of two parts. One, I'm gonna talk about what's going on this semester. And then when I'm done with that, I wanna think about what's gonna happen in spring 2021. And the first thing that I wanna say about fall 2020 is that you know it's, it, it's not perfect because students have had a difficult transition and a lot of first year students in particular um, had issues in the final semester of their senior year. Um, as an institution, we're committed to providing the same rigor in our courses. We want students to meet the same learning outcomes that they would any other year. We know that that poses some special challenges because we're doing all of our business differently. And I think the main message that I wanna get across to students and also their parents in this particular session is that in order to facilitate the same level of rigor that we normally expect from our students and in all of our courses, we've really ramped up the supports that we provide to students and they take place at multiple different levels. And I and every venue sort of uh, push this information out uh, over and over because I and I think all of us really want students to avail themselves of it. And so I just wanna plant a little seed that if any of you are dealing with your sons or daughters and um, they would like extra support, it exists. It exists at the level of the departments and that starts with faculty. Uh, some departments have special sessions for particular types of courses, sort of study table type uh, events. Our learning commons has really ramped up their support in the form of academic coaches. We have more peer catalysts, we have more tutoring opportunities. Um, and so, you know, we're gonna get students to where they need to be. It's gonna take in some ways a little bit of extra effort this semester, I think, uh, but those supports are there and uh, students should avail themselves. There's certainly no shame in particular for new students to say, um, I'm brand new here and this isn't like high school and maybe I'm not doing as well as I'd like in this particular course. When that happens, we've got all sorts of uh, processes and people that can help. And that's really the main message that I want to raise for fall 2020. Thinking forward to spring 2021, we've learned a lot this particular semester um, from the students. Uh, some of that's been in sort of formal data collection ways, surveys. There have been some smaller interactions with students. And then, you know, also hallway talk, the folks who teach our courses and who spend the most time with our students you know, huddling together and figuring out what has gone really well and what we can change. And there's sort of two tracks to this. Um, one 
what do we want to keep? What has worked particularly well in the fall? Because some things have gone extraordinarily well. And I want to talk about those first. Um, we have found that certain courses really do lend themselves extraordinarily well to online. Um, they're high quality, they're interactive. A lot of them rely on you know, new software packages and other types of technology, including the Zoom carts. And so for the spring, courses that have been really successful in the online format, many of them will continue to be in that particular format. One of the things that's a good knock-on effect of that is that it frees up classroom space, physical space. And so we can move some of the things that we had either as hybrid or web in the fall to a more fully uh, on ground experience in the spring. So some of the courses that will certainly be more on ground in the spring are labs. Uh, in particular, the biology labs will be almost 100% on ground. Um, Many of the courses in which we think that it's difficult to replicate the experience or more difficult to replicate the experience, things like studio art will be fully on ground. And then departments similarly to the entire institution are also ramping up different types of supports. After sort of doing this QFlex experience for you know eight or so weeks at this point, we've learned sort of where the pain points are. And so in students majors, there will be more resources that didn't perhaps exist at the start of fall that will be there for the spring of 2021. And so I think my main message is that this has been, you know, a learning experience for all of us, but there, we're working very hard to, um, you know, keep what is working well and improve on the things that we think need improved upon. And also, Resources exist and uh, students should uh, feel no shame and should say, hey, I might need help. Um, and that's sometimes not only a message that comes from students. I, I, I do have parents contact me um, and that's also totally fine. You can find me in the QU directory um, and I'm happy to speak with you individually if any of you have questions about the schedule or about curricula. Um, so I think I will stop there and uh, that's it, thanks. Thanks very much, Wes. <clears throat> and now I'll pass the agenda over to uh, Rick Del Vecchio, who oversees the advising, which is at the core of a CAS education for our students. Rick. I think to echo a little bit of what Dean Renfro just said, I think uh, one of the challenges we were confronted with when all of this began, and remember for us it began as our previous class was about to graduate. So. There were a lot of changes and things we had to do quickly to make sure the senior class got off to a good start, even in the midst of all the chaos that was happening. And we had been, for those of you who have seen some of our other presentations at maybe an open house or an admitted students day, you know about our advising process and how we work with students. But what we had to do was modify that just a little bit for the largely virtual environment we were going into. And so one of the adjustments that we made is things that could be shifted virtually did shift virtually. One of the biggest of which is gonna be our career fair, which is actually coming up just next week, which is a good timing for us to all be talking with you today. And that's gonna be on Monday and Tuesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. And it's a great opportunity. And I think that's one of the, the things that is sort of the hidden uh, benefit of what's happening is for everything that is bad about how we've had to adjust, some of the positives that are there is for something like a career fair, we now have employers who couldn't join us in the past. If it's an employer from California, they were not necessarily gonna fly out here to interview our students. Now they can join us. Um, some of the other tools that you're seeing here are things that we've put in place, some of which existed, some of which we created um, to help us adjust. But one is that Bobcat Connect tool, which if you have not heard of this yet, is a tool to connect our students with alumni. And that's been an incredible tool for our students to use both on the early side for exploration, to just talk to folks who work in the careers where they wanna go eventually, as well as for the seniors and juniors who are looking for internships and full-time jobs to make actual real world connections with folks in industry who can help them. And so we've been able to combine those and then add some other stuff on top. And that's where you see um, LinkedIn we've always been using, but Slack is a new addition. And for those of you that are familiar with Slack, it's a workspace uh, collaboration tool, but the way that we're starting to use it is for uh, folks inside and outside the university to collaborate around a concept. And so the place that we've introduced it initially is around resume writing. And so as students begin to write resumes, they can drop into our Slack channel and ask quick questions. They get me I'm on it 24 seven, so they can kind of get me whenever they need to. 
and we bring in others to leave advice as well. So other students can comment and we're bringing in folks from the outside and our counselors and staff from the advising center. So everybody's involved with helping answer those questions. And then the last thing, if you see in this upper right corner is our senior success center. That was something we developed right as our students were going out the door that was targeted resources to adapt in real time to the environment as it was changing over the course of the summer. So different opportunities for uh, whether it was something called a micro internship or opportunities to gain some little chunks and gain experience in little chunks to other tools and resources that were sort of pandemic specific to allow folks to adjust. So we've, our, our model was sort of set up to really take advantage of digital resources anyway. And we've been able to sort of adapt and add resources to that process to make things even easier for our students going by. So we're going to continue to do pretty much everything that you see here and continue to adapt and make it work as we go. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dean Smart. One of the things that we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of is the framework that we uh, have developed over the last half decade to make sure that our students are not only prepared for the marketplace, but that they uh, will thrive in this marketplace, no matter how different the marketplace happens to look now. Uh, the marketplace is something that we spend a great deal of time looking at because one of the things that's different about arts and sciences at QU is that the College of Arts and Sciences at QU is a professional school. Uh, it is a school that is dedicated to providing students with precisely the sorts of things they need to thrive uh, once they graduate. And the 98% uh, success rate that we have in doing that with our students uh, is reflective of how well I think that has worked uh, over the last half decade. And I just want to very quickly just name the four pillars of our work here uh, that will help you understand what it is that we have devoted ourselves to and we're still devoting ourselves to even if we've had to contend with this virtual environment of ours because of the uh, COVID pandemic. We have at the at the core of a CAS education whether you're in philosophy or you're in biomedical uh, studies or you're in, in economics it doesn't matter you're going to be exposed and expected to take uh, part in some kind of applied and experiential learning experience. Uh, you need to see how the problem solving tools that you gain in your classroom actually work in the outside world. Now that's a particular issue now because of course many places that we've been able to place students and have them do internships no longer want our students there for safety reasons, their safety and the, and the safety of the environment. Uh, and so what we've done is we've relied pretty heavily on remote internships. Uh, and that's been pretty successful. We've, uh, we just opened up, for example, um, a, new, a new bin of virtual uh, internship experiences uh, through a company called Omprakash. They do these in 29 different countries. And we have a donor who's decided that this is an important enough part of a College of Arts and Sciences education that he has supplied monies to pay for 40 students who want to take this experience uh, and it will cost them nothing. And so we uh, sent out information this month, this week, actually, I sent some out yesterday uh, and we're hopeful that we can get 40 of our students to participate in this. They'll be remote uh, internships, but we'll try to give the students who participate in them a sense for what it's like to be working in a, in a problem solving way in different contexts across the world. And then as soon as this pandemic turns into something much more positive, uh, we can then add to students an on-ground experience that coincides and correlates with what they've done uh, in, in the remote setting that, that we have to work with now. We haven't deterred or changed our minds about the necessity of providing students with 21st century professional skills and literacies. Uh, they need to understand what a workplace requires. You can't be afraid of a, tech, of a technological context for the work you're going to do. You have to understand the necessity of speaking well, writing well, not just correctly, but writing precisely, speaking precisely. Uh, writing can be one of the most powerful problem solving tools that we have. But if you don't do it precisely, if you don't use it precisely, then its problem solving power is diminished, severely diminished. Um, we want to make sure that students understand that the whole package is necessary, not just the work that you work through in, in your major and your minor. It's the whole package, the whole cultural package that comes with being an arts and sciences major. Um, the marketplace is telling us in a thousand different ways that interdisciplinary learning is one of the most important tools in a student's toolkit. 
And it is part and parcel of what you do in arts and sciences. You cannot get a degree with us unless you participate pretty meaningfully in interdisciplinary uh, thinking and, and problem solving experiences. And as Rick mentioned a bit earlier, uh, this is all wrapped by our 360 degree advising, which provides students from the moment they step on campus, whether they step on campus virtually or they step on campus physically. Um, we start the conversation about how the, the decisions you make academically, and they're your decisions, we help you try to clarify where you want to go and what you want to do. All of those decisions have an impact in what will wait for you at the time that you graduate when you're looking at either getting into a graduate program of your choice or a career of your choice. It's not a discussion that should start semester seven or semester eight. It's a discussion that needs to begin semester one. And we are dedicated to providing that context all the way through. So while the means and the venues have changed, uh, the actual focus has not. We are focused just as intently and just as fully on these four pillars as part of what an arts and sciences student uh, gets a chance to go through. Um, so in, in the next slide, what we'll try to do is give you a sense here, um, and Rick will continue the conversation. We'll try to give you a sense here of the kinds of things we mean from uh, when we talk about what our graduates are prepared to do when they leave. And, and Rick, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. So, you know, if you were paying attention to the way that the Dean just described our process, you can see the elements that exist and that are critical to making sure our students develop in the way that we want them to develop. And the first part of that is really the key is the idea of early engagement. When we talk to our students on the way out the door, we survey all of our seniors as they graduate. And one of the first things we ask them is, what is it that you didn't do that you wish you did? And we use that information to inform how we develop our resources and our advising conversations to make sure that we're moving them more and more into engagement early. Because the earlier they start, the more opportunity there is. For students to have the success that our students have on the way out the door, they have that because they've used their experience to the fullest while they are here. And it starts with the lower level easy stuff, the things like participating in clubs and organizations on campus, then engaging with research on campus, working with your faculty, then moving it off campus and doing internships and experiential learning and study abroad. All the things that add to the richness of your experience and help you start to develop the skill set and the story that you need to tell the employers on the way out. That gets combined with the academic experience that you have while you're here. We've seen a lot of increase in folks interested in doubles, ma double majoring and double minoring or minoring. And you end up with a scenario where you get to explore multiple areas and take the information that you learn from one discipline and apply it to another. And that skill set of being able to examine issues and, and skills in that fashion and apply those skills in that fashion is one of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace as a highly sought after skill from the employer side of things. And again, experiential learning and advising support that. And those are critical that those are, that every, every part of this is happening at every step along the way. All of these choices inform the next step in the process. And so looking at it systematically as you go through time helps you develop that, that skill set that you want on the way out. And that's what we mean when we talk about versatility is that the students who have gone through this process pay attention to it and engage in it can pretty much pick where they want to go. The way you start as an English major and end up leading the marketing organization of a major corporation is because you've engaged in experiences that put you in the position to do that. And so that's what we look for with our students is no matter what path you want, you're doing the things while you're here to put you in best position for that. Thank you, Rick. Um, just a little anecdote from uh, some of the meetings we've had this week. This week has been an interesting week for us. We've tried something new where we've gathered um, clumps of, of disciplines that lead to majors in arts and sciences, given them each a night so that people could begin to get a sense for what it means to be in the social sciences or in the pure sciences and mathematics or in the humanities and fine arts. Uh, and of course, the stars of those shows are our students. Um, we're there, but uh, Really and truly, nobody comes to the university or to the college because of the dean. Uh, they come because they find in the stories of our students something really resonating. It, it, it moves them in ways to think about 
their own careers and their own futures. We have 31 students helping us out this semester. And I was just, and I've interviewed them all. I've, I've taken a half an hour and talked to each one of them very carefully. They're a pretty, they're, they're a bunch of stars. They truly are. But I was just struck this time around of the 31 students, 11 of them are double majors. And they're not just double majors in similarly in similar clusters of disciplines like economics and political science, that sort of thing. Uh, I have double majors that run GDD in English, game design in English, biology in English. I mean, it's just a very uh, set of choices that these students have done. And when you listen to them tell their story, um, which is what we want them to help uh, help us do with, with potential students, you can't help but be compelled because these are the students who are going to be successful when they graduate from here. I mean, it's been a remarkable experience for me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dean and usually when students come and see me, they're not coming to see me for good reasons. Um, my ability to be able to talk to these 31 young men and women has been remarkable, absolutely remarkable. In, in the midst of this pandemic, it's given me faith in how we're going to get out of this in, in good shape. So uh, let's go to the next slide and then I'll give you a sense for what we hope is going to be uh, the result at the end of all of this. Um, just a few months ago, uh, President Olian asked a couple of deans to lead a reimagining the university initiative just to consider what QU could look like post COVID. We're going to be post COVID at some point. Um, and so once, once the pressure is released, once we can begin to look at resuming full, fuller lives on campus, on ground, we can begin to enjoy the beauty of the campus and the pleasure of our company as teachers and peers and, and cohorts. Um, What's what's going to look like? What's going to stay? Uh, Wes alluded to this in his uh, his conversation a moment ago. Uh, and what's going to remain? What's going to be new? What what can we expect the new normal to be like? And I was in charge of one part of this of this task force, uh, in which I was asked to head a team of faculty and administrators uh, to to consider what the impact of this on higher ed is going to be. And I just wanted to share with you three things that are likely to be part of the conversation going forward. We will be talking about these three things probably for over a year or two uh, as we start to figure out when the dust settles, what exactly is left as landmarks in this landscape of ours. More than anything else, I think, the whole idea of teaching and learning space has changed. Uh, up until the COVID pandemic, we've talked about teaching and learning space largely in terms of bricks and mortar, uh, classrooms, buildings, laboratories, places where students do their work and places where their supports are located in the learning commons or the advising commons in arts and sciences. All of a sudden now the idea of space where we get together, where we congregate in a very purposeful way to do teaching and learning, um, all of a sudden that's changed. Wes was talking earlier about classes that are particularly well suited for a web environment, where the kinds of things you can do with the technology that you have at hand can actually enhance a class way beyond the potential that a regular traditional lecture class can offer. Uh, in many ways, our students are telling us they would much prefer to be in that enriched web environment than sitting in a large classroom waiting for somebody to finish a lecture. And so those things are not gonna change, I believe. Uh, we're going to change our minds, I think, about what it means to be a part, a full-time part of a university or a college. Um, we'll have colleagues who are going to work remotely, I suspect. I think we're not going to be requiring people who want a job with us to move from California to Connecticut. They can do their work remotely just as fully and just as carefully as they could do it on ground. I think that's one of the changes that will come with this whole idea. I mentioned earlier, uh, we were talking about the necessity of interdisciplinary work. The, the marketplace has changed in some very profound ways and probably to my mind anyway, one of the most profound ways is this development of an interdisciplinary understanding of what it means to be working in that kind of environment. Um, the standard 50 you know, years ago kind of major preparation where you did a major and you did a minor if you were a little bit adventurous and then all the rest of it was the sort of lima beans part of your education you had to do gen ed but you were focused on what the major would give you that's a really poor preparation for this marketplace 
Um, employers are telling us in a in hundred different ways, send me someone who has a much broader sense for their capacity as, as problem solvers and a much deeper understanding of what it means to enter a different culture. The places where we work are cultures. That, that's not changing. That's not going to, to suddenly, you know, sort of transform into something else. And students who are unfamiliar with the means by which you identify cultural differences and then adapt yourself to make best use of those differences and to bring your talents and resources and, and your experience to the table. The kids who can do that are the ones who are incredibly successful. We know this again and again and again. Rick interviews uh, all of the candidates who graduate from arts and sciences six months out. What's, what's your experience been? What are you doing? What kinds of things seem important to you? If you could go back, the question that he asked, I asked this of some of the students uh, this week, if you could go back right now, your seniors, if you could go back and pick something, anything at all that you should have done and didn't do, you thought about it, but you didn't do it. All of them, every last one of those students told me that one of the things they would most like to go back and do is pick up an experience that is way outside their major, something that's way outside their choice of uh, traditional majors and, and minors. For some kids, that's that's a double major. For other students, it's work in a, a in an, an internship environment. I had two students who who talked eloquently about what they gained by working over the summer with a faculty member. Those are the things that are going to bring our students to the interview table with confidence, and will get them through to the point where they want to be. Um, last and last and, and and not least, I think I want to get back just for a moment. <clears throat> to our choice to provide our students with some powerful applied and experiential learning experiences. We, when we redid our strategic plan almost a decade ago, we realized as a college, this had to be the keel upon which all the other experiences of students would be built. Um, we graduate no students who have not had a chance to try out what they learn in the classroom outside of the classroom. And we've made that point in the open houses. We've made that point in the initial orientation meetings that we have with brand new students. We've made that point in the departmental meetings. We've made that point in all of the engagements that we have with students. It is a requirement for almost half of our majors. Um, and we constantly see places and means by which we can connect students with those settings that will invite them to take what they learned in class and apply it to a real problem, a real world problem. And get feedback, not from professors who teach the theoretical work, but from those who are in that marketplace or that workplace about just how well they did. How well did your problem solving strategy work? Did you find a way to change the dynamic of the problem so that it revealed itself to be a problem with a solution wrapped up in it? Uh, the students who do those things and you, I hope you get a chance to do this with your uh, students, your children, when it's time. The students who do those things are remarkable when they start to talk about it, because you can tell that it's transformative. It changes the game for them. And so I just wanted to share these three pieces with you, because whatever it ends up looking like past this point, whenever this pandemic finally decides to relinquish its hold on the national conversation, the international conversation, and we begin to start rebuilding something that begins to look like a new normal. These will not change. These things will not change. They will drive the questions we ask. They will drive the decisions we make. And my sincere belief is that it will drive the preparation that we bring to the table for our students. It will allow us to push students past the limitations that they often bring with them to college to realize something pretty cool pretty incredibly cool, uh, the realization of their dreams about what they want to do after graduation. That's no small thing. I mean, I'm getting to the age now where I can barely remember what it was like when I was in college. Um, but when you talk to these students about the power of the dream they have when they want to get out, you can tell it's transformative. It's, it's going to make them into different human beings. All for the better. I mean, seriously, all for the better. So with that, I think I'll stop my yammering here and, and we'll open the, the rest of the hour up for any of your questions.
Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. And folks, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screens, you'll have an option for a chat. Feel free to just type your questions right into the chat there and we'll take your questions. They're all stunned, I suspect. <laughs> Well, if there are no questions, I really want to wish you uh, a really joyful sort of rest of the weekend. Uh, these sunny, it's not exactly warm, but these sunny fall weekends are probably not going to last a whole lot longer. And I hope you get a chance to enjoy the rest of it. Uh, and again, thank you very much for joining us. It was our pleasure to share what we do with you because we're pretty excited about what we do. So all of you have a great day.